You're listening to Crossing Borders with ANYP for the Always Next Year Podcast Studio Network. You can find the team on our Twitter at ANY Podcast or visit us on our website, www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. And now, to bring us in, the Jack Dolls. On that son of a bitch again. He cracked open a rib or two. He beat me suddenly through and through. And so she over my unconscious reign. I won me healthy sheriff fights. Well, lucky son still had me life since Mickey Flynn beat me dumb and lame. Good day, everybody, and welcome to the Always Next Year Podcast Network. Uh, I'm Connor Donald, and we are here today with Shane to present to you another episode of Cross and Borders, where Shane and I, as diplomatically as possible, um, talk about Philadelphia sports' hottest uh, news and takes going on, and what an exciting week it was. The Eagles season finally got kicked off. So that is some exciting stuff, considering the rest of the teams have done almost nothing. Um, how are you doing tonight, Shane? Uh, man, I am. I'm just glad to be home. I've had a morning from hell, so uh, good. Good to be uh, home in studio, talking to you about Philadelphia sports. Absolutely, and you got to watch an Eagles win yesterday, albeit a little uh, stressful. But uh, a little. I mean, well, I mean, it's to be expected. This is why I was on the side of give them a series or two during the preseason. Then you don't need an entire half to look like complete garbage and cause Philly Twitter to go into a complete panic and an uproar. Yeah, I mean, I would still take, obviously, hindsight 2020, the result of yesterday in its entirety and knowing that we made it through preseason relatively healthy versus risking the unknown of extensive injury. You know, we saw it with obviously Lamar Miller. We you know, saw it with a number of other athletes from other teams as well. So for me, I'm, I'm glad to have made it out of preseason with just a Camo Grugier Hill injury and, uh, and everyone else relatively healthy. I agree. I mean, I guess at, at the end of the day, yeah, with hindsight 2020, if we played them and they were healthy, we wouldn't be having this discussion. We didn't play them. They won game one. So we're not really having this discussion either. We're, we're <laughs> just saying we're happy that the Eagles won. So that that's all that matters. So I guess with that in mind, we're, we're a game late, but it's not like we didn't have us both have the Eagles start in 1-0. and And if you had them going 0-1-1, well, um, that that's kind of sad. Just a sign of your crappy morning, maybe. But so let's start with the Eagles <laughs> and start off with some record predictions and how far you think they make it in the playoffs. Um, I guess I'll start with uh, some some tweets that we got on uh, from the uh, Kelly Greenhour post that that um, L posted. He posted it but never used it, so. I saw all those people tweeting, so I'm going to use it before we get into our predictions. Go for it. So we got uh, Angry Jim who says uh, that Eagles are— First of all, if people don't listen to his show already, do yourself the favor. Listen to his network. Listen to Brotherly Pod over there as well. Uh, You know, He and Dan do a fantastic job, but Jim is one of the funniest humans I have ever listened to. So please, go listen to that man. Yeah, and uh, talk about humor here. He says 17 and O, oh, the and 17 and O oh in Eagles versus doesn't matter. Yes, 17. They they win even during the bye week. <laughs> kind of tongue twisted me there. Uh, we got Anthony Jones. Uh, I don't even know why this guy posted. I think he posted literally just to get a rise out of us. Um, Buff- Buffalo Bills versus Dallas Cowboys. Bills win in the Super Bowl. Cute. If that doesn't say troll, I don't Honestly, know. Honestly, I think that's your burner account. I listened to your Kelly Green Hour, Mr. Playoff Bills. Hey, hey, did I put them in the Super Bowl? No, I, I put them in the playoffs, <laughs> not the Super Bowl. Let's calm down there. <laughs> um, at Brosif Biscuit, 11-5. I don't even know anything about football. 
Well, at least he made the effort, the concerted <laughs> effort to post for us. Broseph Biscuit is Joe. He is one of our Philadelphia Phillies writers over here at AMYP. He's a good guy. I did laugh out loud with his uh, with his tweet, though. <laughs> uh, got another 11 wins. Eagles versus Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Seems a popular choice. Yes, it um, is. That's from at Cameron Beards uh, at Philly guy 73 Eagles 12 and four uh, after last night. I would say this prediction is way off win the Super Bowl over Pittsburgh mm-hmm. might just be that my... team looked pretty terrible last night. Pretty yeah. Terrible. Oh, yeah. And at Amarella said 12. And yes, I can't remember what the question was. I think it was, will they make it to the Super Bowl? Um, then we have. Uh, Eagles 12 and 4 regular season and a storybook Super Bowl could be would be us versus the Jags, but more likely to see us and Pats again as a Which, rubber by match. The way, so sad about Nick Foles. That guy cannot catch a break. I I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I was like, oh, it doesn't look that bad. And then when I was the only one at the house, clothes, I was like, oh man. So I saw him make the throw, the rainbow that never came down. And then when, well, almost never came down. And when it finally did, obviously it was a dime for a touchdown, which just shows off his deep ball ability and fantastic placement and touch. But then I saw him get up from the pile and I'm like, this man dislocate his, his non-throwing shoulder. What the hell happened? And then sure enough, ends up being a collarbone, which I'm, I think was the same one he hurt in 2014 or 15, I want to say. So, I mean, two collarbone injuries, you're not really supposed to be able to break that bone twice, but it is what it is. But, uh, yeah, feel terrible for that guy. Oh, he, he just can't catch her. And he had a rough off season too. So, I mean, we feel for him because he brought us that Super Bowl. So, and the AMYP monkey got involved. Don't know how the hell he typed, but he said Scott Kingery's 2019 home run total <laughs> and a gif of, of Scott Kingery. And our own at Radio Rob, 17 and 2, 14 and 2 regular season, and 3 and 0 playoffs capped with a Super Bowl victory over Big Red. So now with that in mind, we got some crazy predictions. We got some outright outlandish predictions. What do you think the Eagles' record will be? What game are you most excited for? And are we going to the Super Bowl? Are we seeing Super Bowl banner number mm-hmm. two being raised? Uh, so I think after seeing yesterday uh it will be either a 10 and 6 or an 11 and 5 season um i don't question our talent um i don't even question our talent after seeing our secondary get abused by case keenum uh for me this is 100 percent. this team is going to go as far as their coaching staff allows them to go um yesterday we saw on both sides of the football from both doug peterson and jim schwartz just absolutely atrocious play calling we did see both of them at times make adjustments but it's going to be can these two put their players in the best position to succeed because the talent is in my opinion very much so there um i do fear the cowboys way more than i anticipated now I'm, i don't take anything uh, against the giants game seriously Dak i was had gonna a great, say because everyone had a great everyone's, game everyone's the fucking preaching giants. that yeah. that Dak deserves like like a boatload of money for that game like calm Good. down it's it's the giants Good. i mean pay give them you know give them the money them now give them the money but same for the people who think lamar jackson's like the second coming of like christ because he beat up, on up the, dolphins. the dolphins a team full of people who want to fucking leave like it's brilliant that's disgraceful was, that's this i was listening to the radio today and someone made a comment and it is so true you're asking to leave the team yeah, you're part of the reason that you got lit up. What? Who's gonna Dude, go out there and point. say? Who's gonna go out there and say, "Oh yeah, I want that guy. I want that defensive tackle who couldn't even get within five yards of that quarterback. That's my guy." I don't know, man. I would not find the most motivation to. I mean, seeing the way that their off season went. I mean, I mean, trading. Tannehill, you make the trade for Rosen, who you don't name your starting quarterback, um, you know, and then to to move Laramie Tunzel, which the locker room had already said, hey, don't freaking move this guy. And they were like, mm, screw you. We're doing it anyway. To me, and Kenny still like this was just I wouldn't get up and play for that team either right now. I, I would I wouldn't even dress. I'd a be it, honestly. You know, I, I, I'd be calling producers and making YouTube videos. No one wants to sit there and play for the damn Dolphins right now. Oh, um, but we're not a Dolphins podcast, so I'm going to stick by 
by 10 and 6 and 11 and 5. And to answer your second question, I, I think you could pick either one of the Dallas matchups. Last year, we we got screwed against Dallas. There's no other way to put it. Um, you know, it, the the Dallas Goddard touchdown that wasn't the fumble that was covered by 14 and a half Eagles and not a Cowboy in sight, but it wasn't clear because they're it was fucking in Dallas. Um, you know, <laughs> Let's not be too resentful. You don't so, want to sound like a Saints fan here. So, well, you know what? I am borderline Saints-ish if it comes to that that game in particular. That was atrocious. Um, and they were atrocious yesterday, by, by the way, in that first and second quarter uh, of the, the New York and Dallas game. Um, so, again, as always, money in pockets of refs coming from Jerry Jones. Um, but that that series if you will those two games against the cowboys for me are going to be ones where i i will i will glue my eyelids open i will glue the top eyelid to my whatever is right below your eyebrow i don't know what facial features and parts are but i will make sure to not blink because that is going to be that to me is going to tell me just how good the depth of our team is and the coaching on our team is mm-hmm. um, so that that for me is that and then i do not have us making or winning the super bowl um, I have us losing in uh, losing in the NFC Championship game, um, but uh, again, that could easily be swayed if if the coaching staff puts a little bit more uh, faith or gives makes it easier to be you know have some trust in them. Man, I just started a lot through that. Well, that's okay. That's okay. You had a rough morning. We all will forgive and forget. Rough morning. So um, I'm, I was. I, I'm glad that your your homerage stopped too because I I was the same way on the Kelly Green Hour with L. I almost had us not even making it into the conference finals, but it took everything in my nature to say that we would beat Green Bay. So, um, which after seeing Green Bay play on Thursday night, do you, do you feel good about that? Let's get it clear, and I'm going to be one to vouch for it. I hate Thursday night football. I do not. Everyone think does. Teams it's come out problem. with their best. Uh, performance on a Thursday night. So I'm going to take that game with a grain of salt. I want to see this week and what the product that they put out on the field this week on a Sunday or Monday. I don't even know what day they play. But whatever day, it's better than Thursday night. Yes. Um, And I have us finishing at 11-5. and five. Um, The game I'm most excited for that... And it's been the one that I've been most excited for all season. I, I do like the Cowboys' the choice. Rematch. Yes, the Patriots. I'm excited yeah. for that Patriots game, especially with Brown. I am extremely nervous that that is going to be a humongous shootout and our secondary is going to be made to look completely foolish. But we do have a few weeks to prepare ourselves and hopefully learn to play, you know, five yards off instead of 10 or 15 yards off. So we'll see mm-hmm. if if that can improve in the coming Doesn't weeks. It, all right. So let me ask you this. Since you're you're the Razul Douglas, like you're driving that bus for all of the city of Philadelphia um, remotely controlled by a drone uh, of some sorts you know, up there in Canada. But he got burnt bad you know he he, he did get burned is, he did get burned i'll admit it it, it, was, it was ugly it was terry mclaurin who so, also put up an amazing 40 time he's filthy he is crazy fast he is but fast my so my question is and like do not i don't want to get this twisted in any particular way i'm not saying that Razul douglas is the player i'm about to compare him to but their style to me is very similar doesn't Razul Douglas strike you as someone who is only going to have the ability to truly reach his potential as basically being Oakland's version of Namde Asama, bump at that line, use his physicality there, and make you beat him in the first three yards and not get behind him? Doesn't that bode so much better than, let's put the slowest corner in the history of corners 14 yards off a receiver? Yeah, it make sense I, 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 I can see it. I, I can see because he is aggressive. So you want him up there. He's strong. And, and, He's got and, long and, arms. And the, he can jam you. Yeah, you want him up there and you want him in his that person's face and like mess him with that guy long enough that the play unfolds before that guy can even get five or six yards downfield. Like I understand but, it's a lost thing in the NFL now. Like there are not that many corners that are playing right up on the line with you with that jam you because the physical edge of football is just not the way that it used to be. But f- when your skill set is that, and I believe that he has the ability to be elite in that role. 
I, it it's not an every snap role. I have to be clear about that. If there's no safety help over the top or just the one safety, you know you have to shade them that way, and that's putting a lot of pressure on the other side of the field. But if you have the ability to have two safeties back, if you have the ability to have someone over the top just in case, like you got to put his ass up there on the line. Like every snap mm-hmm. he is he is out there. So it, I don't know. To me, it, it's Jim Jim Schwartz just forever saying. You're going to fit my system. I'm not going to find some. I'm not going to be Belichick. I'm not going to find players and say, how can I maximize their skill set? I'm going to say, you're either going to do it this way or you're just not going to fucking play. And I hate Jim Schwartz for that. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it would be not like I would rather see him get some aggressive holding calls up on the line than being burnt or oh, taking yeah. a pass interference 20 yards down the field and giving them like 15 yards. It's just, it doesn't make sense to me. So if you're up on that line, you're being physical, the play unfolds, you get a holding penalty once, once a game or once every couple of games, I can live with that over getting burnt for a, what was it? A 60 some yard touchdown, 50 some yard touchdown. Mm-hmm. I, I can live with that if you can be aggressive, but at the same time, Jim Schwartz has to realize if you want him to be that guy, you can't have him on the fastest wide receiver on the field. You have to have him on a guy who who he can play physical with, who he can stand at the line, and who he has somewhat of a chance of competing with. Because if they know he's coming to the line to be aggressive, then a guy like Terry McLaurin will just take a quick jab step and gone. And he'll you won't have to worry about him being burnt 30 yards down the field. He'll be have been burnt two yards down the field, and McLaurin will be 20 yards down the field before he even turns his head. So, I mean, it's it's interesting. I, it'll be interesting to see what he does with with the secondary because you can't have them playing 10 yards off all season. Eventually, you got to get them being a bit more aggressive. So, agreed. And I have uh, I I actually have us losing in the Super Bowl to to the uh, big red. Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, uh, that makes Steve happy, host of AMYP Chiefs Talk. Yep, exactly my thoughts. Uh, but I, like I said, like I had us making it into the conference to face New Orleans, but I had a hard time even getting us to that matchup with, with Green Bay. I had us playing Green Bay in that uh, second matchup. I had us playing Dallas. I don't have us as one of the top seeds in the East, so or in the NFC. So. Yeah. Dude, I think the division is going to be way tighter than I, I think we all kind of assumed, just based on roster and uh, conference or division. No, the division. I do not think it's going to be some cakewalk, and, and we're, you know, we're going to just run through the NFC. I mean, it's a two two horse race. Like it's us and Dallas. I'm not saying I fear Washington or because they put up 17 in the first half, or I fear the Giants because they have Saquon and nothing else. But hmm. between us and Dallas, I, I mean, I I think it's I think it's going to go down to week 17. Personally. I think one of us is going to need the help of Washington or New York. There will be some crazy upset by Washington or New York that will probably decide the division more than likely. Because, you know, that almost always happens in our division. Well, in all a divisions. team is completely out of it, winning against the team who's at the top or the second place team looking to make that run. Yeah, look, it happens in every division. It's some, there's something different about you, playing the teams that you play twice a year every year. Like yeah, they, you got to you got to just, just hate it. You got to just you scout it. differently. You know these guys. You know these coaches. You're more familiar with these schemes. You, you know the rivalries bring out a, a, a more intense emotion. They typically, you know, if they're even remotely close towards the end of the the end of the season, they're getting flexed into those primetime games. Like there's there's a lot that goes into those games. So it's easy. To, to see why those games bring out, you know, you can throw the records aside. This is a football game. This is going to be a dog fight. Mm, absolutely. So we both seem to agree that uh, we're looking at a 10 and 6, 11 and 5 uh, race with the Cowboys for number one in the NFC East. And we both have us losing you one round before me. Um, so hopefully now we sit back and we intensely watch the next 15 games of Eagles football. But <laughs> until then, I'm going to give you the choice between the downright ugly Phillies or the not so ugly Flyers in our next choice. Uh, let's go with the Flyers. 
let's uh yeah we we always save the flyers for last and i just always feel like they deserve so much more well i think it's what 20 20 27 days till the season starts something like that uh yes i think it's october 7th or 9th i can't remember yeah i think it, i saw um, it today it's jvr days till the regular season so okay so there we go we'll get we're getting there uh so we might we as well on get our way we might as well get them, you know, give them a bit more respect instead of having them carry up the back of the show. So I kind of came up with this topic based on the whole last offseason, Claude Drew being underrated, one of the most underrated players in the NHL and Flyers history. And I came up with this question for us in this show. How can we stop Sean Couturier from becoming the next Claude Drew? We already are talking about it like he's Zach Claude Giroux. How can we stop that talk and have a put a different mentality? Give him some sort of different type of respect, so a more more of a chance than we gave Claude Giroux. How how can we get the NHL's attention to realize the amazing talent we have in Philadelphia? That we're not just this mediocre team. So do you have a tweet? Do you have a take? What do you have on this? Well, I mean, obviously, you just have to hire Peter Laviolette and give him a microphone. He'll say that he's the best player in the world. I mean, that's how Claude Giroux became Claude Giroux, right? That would be the logical, simple way, but we're not looking for that. That would be the cynicism and, and sarcasm in me. Um, no, but I do have, a t- well, I have two tweets. Um, the original tweet is not my actual thing, it's the response that I'll give after it. But uh, I referenced this man last week, uh, Jamie Baskell of Philadelphia Sports Network, fantastic Flyers coverage over there. Uh, he had posed the initial kind of tweet and uh i wouldn't be shocked if this is something that scrolled through your timeline which gave you the idea for the topic but Pascal's tweet was the flyers are not getting any respect whatsoever by or this offseason by members throughout the nhl soon enough we will see who the real flyers are an underdog is a hundred dog i mean coots doesn't even get the respect of being on a top 20 list of centers crazy now Basically the exact same thing that you said. So here is the response tweets that I will use. Uh, They are from Tool Boa. It is at Tool BOA. They've made it 10 years of mediocre moves and produced 10 years of mediocre hockey. No respect given because they are truly mediocre at their best. Jamie, because he's a classy guy, just said, I respect your opinion. So he responded again, this Tool BOA. They'll get league-wide respect when they put together multiple defense Deep playoff runs. I'm reading like halfway through my uh, my phaser here. Hold on. I can, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't exactly think this through. I'm like reading through like a mesh screen, if you will. Um, but uh, the individual accomplishments, accomplishments of G, Coots, etc. Um, it will be, they will remain largely unnoticed until they win. And that's 100% correct. That is the only thing that you can do. We talked about it a little bit last week. I think the guys on DOE talked to, talked about it, Disciples of Ed, uh, talked about it a little bit in their show earlier this week as well. Winning does cure everything. You know, this is this is not a sexy hockey team for the last decade plus. You know, it's I I think I made the point last week that it was you're not a bottom two or three team where like that one guy is the one guy that makes people come out. Like closure is phenomenal, but he's not. He's not Connor McDavid. Like he's people aren't going to come out even though they're winning what 20 hockey games a year, 28 hockey games a year. We're literally middle of the road. It is just constant turning the knife, putting the knife in and turning it as slowly as humanly possible. You get to game 82, which in, is inevitably an important one in some capacity for the goddamn Flyers. And that's when the final turn hits and you're like, "All right, either they were moved the knife and were patched and were limping into the playoffs or they just turned it that extra mile and we missed the postseason again. You know, for me, the only way that you can get a phenomenal talent like Sean Couturier to be truly recognized is to put together a true deep playoff run for the Philadelphia Flyers as a team, or you have to have a Kucherov season. You have to have 125 points or something absurd for anyone to really give a shit about you. And we know that would involve the Flyers score and you could a trade for Patrick Line of times. If but you that trade would, for that Patrick Line and put him on the top line, Sean Couturier is going to get fucking talked about. I'm speaking, sorry. Speaking speaking of that, and I don't know if it's true, but I did see someone tweeting about maybe Line to the uh, Anaheim Ducks. But no, nah, that was a sarcastic tweet by a guy who's got like 38 followers. You never know. Well, I'm going to hold my breath. 
No, yeah, that's like me saying I have like a 12 inch cock. Let, like certain be... things are just not credible. Oh, wow. Oh, Jesus. Okay. I went there. You're, gonna just, you're just going to admit that outright there's in the middle of our show. There's nothing wrong with average. Sweet Jesus. There's nothing wrong with the average. I was talking about the 12 inch part. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's true. We we don't know. We don't know. Um, <laughs> it's not. Probably. So so uh, I got I got a tweet from Ked at K underscore Buchanan eight. He said, "Worst part about another flyer season is that Sean Couturier is going to be one of the best players in the league again, and he still won't get the credit he deserves. It's a shame. It is a shame." And this Isn't is the, that same- the worst way to end a tweet, like emotionally, like when you read, it's a shame at the end. That is like, I'm always like, oh, man, it really that is. is. That is the Flyers. That is a Flyers tweet from the heart. <laughs> that is the Flyers. Like, that's the Flyers cynicism, the fans. That's how we feel. That's just how we are. That's who we are. We have to end it with it's a shame or we deserve better or something along those lines. And I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's it's true. It is it is a shame that Sean Couturier and Claude Drew may go down as these completely underappreciated and disrespected. Not really, I wouldn't say disrespected, but underappreciated players who just were stuck on a mediocre team. And it's true, the best way to get out of that is to make a deep playoff run. And not just a deep playoff run, because that's not going to get Sean Couturier noticed. Sean Couturier has to lead that team. Sean Couture has to take control from Claude Drew, and he has to be that guy. He has to put up a 100-point season. He has to be the, the leader, I mean, without having the C on his chest. He has to be the leader. And, and I mean, like you said, a Kucherov season, I don't even think he'd get the respect with a Kucherov season at this point. We need the Flyers to show that we're not a mediocre team, and we're here to play, and I think this year is the beginning of that. But I... But I digress because I am <laughs> full of positivity for the Flyers this year. So yeah, you sound it. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, well, I just read a tweet that said it's a shame at the end. Am I supposed to be excited right now? Is, it, is mean, that so, am I supposed to come out and be the power of positivity for us right now? I feel as though you should. Well, I have been as positive as I can. I said this is a year it turns around. This is a year Katori puts up a hundred points and he brings home some hardware. And uh, we make a semi-deep playoff run. That, I like that, it. Is that positivity? That's, is that that's perfect. There you go. I, hey, that, my 12 is half job. Well done. <laughs> All right. So next. And someone's going to be really disappointed someday and listen to this. And they'll be like, wow, that's totally not it at all true. <laughs> damn oh. shame. It, it is a damn shame, but we have to be positive. We have to lead the charge, you know. And if yes. it happens, I will come back to this point in the show and show people like I was there when nobody else <laughs> wanted to be. Hey, I give you credit constantly on Twitter now. For I know I, I appreciate that. I really, I really appreciate that because, I mean, for you, it would be difficult with the way the Phillies have been this year. Just oh. painful. So why don't we lead into that? And it's just Finally. it's a simple, simple question that requires but a very brief response from you, Shane. Is it too late for the Phillies? We are two games back. We have, what, 20 games to go, and we're heading into a series against the Atlanta Braves, if I'm not mistaken, who have had our number, like, all season. Yeah, everyone's had our fucking so, number. Yes, it it's too late. late, Shane. Is it too, yes. Are we not making the playoffs? Absolutely, we're not making the playoffs. So I have two tweets. All right, one's not an actual tweet. It's just a, it's a quote from a Bryce Harper post game interview. Uh, I want to say, I don't know, like a week, week and a half ago. Um, so uh, this is Bryce Harper on the Philadelphia Phillies' very slim playoff shot. Bryce believes that despite being three and a half games out of a wild card with 28 games to play, so this must have been about, like I said, six, seven days ago, Harper throws out a little bit of history. He says, do you remember 2007 when the Phillies were back seven on the Mets on the Mets, and went on a 13-4 and four run to make the playoffs while the Mets totally collapsed? I have been on record so much supporting Bryce Harper for his just ability to, to – go full in on the city of Philadelphia and the history of our sports. And I've always said that I felt it was genuine. I think 
Bryce Harper is an incredibly smart baseball player and a very smart human. And I think that smart humans at times, unfortunately, hit thirst level. And Bryce Harper did that in that interview. There's no way that the, one of the smartest baseball players I've ever watched can go ahead and look out there at the product that he is a part of. And then over the last two, three days, even though they've won a few games in that, watch this product out on the field and say, oh, yeah, yeah, we could get hot. We could get hot. We got 25 games left. We could totally get hot. We can get into the playoffs because I know they, my history. They can't even win more than like two games in a in row. row. It's in it's a, a row. And, and going 13 and four, if my math is correct, requires you to win a little more than two in a row. Ah, uh, yes. It, 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 your math is correct, sir. You and that master's degree puts a good use for Spot one day. Spot on. Spot um, on. I knew it would come in handy. There it is. On crossing borders. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, for me, this was my, my first thirst level warning for, uh, for Bryce Harper, the player. We've had plenty of thirst level warnings for our fans in the city of Philadelphia towards Bryce Harper. Uh, but Bryce, for me, at a certain point, I'm not saying grab the microphone and say, we're fucking cooked. I'd like to not play September. Uh, but I'm saying maybe just say, we got a lot of fucking work to do, and that's what we have to do. And then just walk away. You don't need to tell me about 2007 and the glory days of wonderfulness that was the beginning of a true, absolute brilliant era of Philadelphia Phillies baseball. Like that's not going to happen with this you roster. Think, right now. You think the Philly media would let him walk away just making that comment without saying, "Excuse me, Bryce, we have like 20 more questions to really drive home the point you just made." Did you, did you not see him last year before the season started when he took his interviews in Washington? He opened up his presser and was just like, just to let you guys know, I'm here to talk about this season, the Washington Nationals and our our quest for World Series baseball and, and to bring it to this city, this great city. But if you're going to ask me about questions about the contract, I'm going to walk right up out and get out this door. First person I'd ask him, he's like, yeah, I already said I'm not talking about that. And then move the hell on. I think, yeah, if you wanted to sit there and just be like, get out of my face, like. That's what's going to happen. But um, my other tweet is in reference to Bryce Harper, thirstiest athlete in Philadelphia of the week. Um, so this is from – and I'm only putting this in here just because I needed to vent about it on some platform. And if I forgot to do it on Incap We Trust, I would be really angry with myself. So you guys all have to bear with me for just a few moments. Uh, and if you listen to Incap We Trust, hopefully I'll do this all over again tomorrow. This is from Tyrone Barkell. I don't know that we should say names. We should probably only say handles. That was probably fucked up. I don't really care. Uh, this is from at Poker Grinder 32. Nationals minus Jesus. <laughs> Bryce Harper equals playoffs. Phillies plus Bryce Harper equals no playoffs. Can we all say? And then in bold, all caps, cancer. You are the dumbest human I've ever read on Twitter. Now, this may be very much so just a trolling, sarcastic comment, and clearly by the massive interaction that your tweet had gained, one retweet and three follow or three likes, it's amazing that it even made it onto my page, honestly. Um, you're an idiot. I'm sorry. That's the dumbest shit I've ever heard you, in my you life. Didn't, you couldn't assume that by the name? Poker Grinder? You didn't, you didn't know that, that that tweet would be really stupid? It's absurd. So... Yeah, they, well, I guess we got like 12 years of cancer to go then. Yeah, yeah. And in that case, I'm 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 for it. Like, he is the least of your problems. He's the least of anyone's problems. My God, what a dumb ass tweet. Like, certain times I sit there and I think like, oh, that was a clever troll. Like, I'm I'm angry about this because like there's a little bit of truth to that. And I'm reading this tweet and I'm like, who the fuck is this? Like, what? I'm just brutal. Like you, there should be a deactivation butter button on Twitter for people that say dumb shit. That to me is that level of dumb. You don't really need social media, sir. Get off. He, he was just looking for some attention, and those he three, those it. three we, retweets was, uh, was uh, enough, know. enough for his pleasure. And now, hopefully, he will listen to Shane completely call him a moron and and to never use social media again. So that we don't have to discuss this again. Man, I hope so. I So I wish that I knew who the hell retweeted this or, or liked it, that it ended up on my timeline, which is another absurd thing on Twitter, by the way. If you run Twitter and you listen to our pod, which you totally do, uh, fucking stop. Just because someone I, I follow, I mean, I know that that's the basis and premises of growing our entire AMYP network, so maybe for us, <laughs> allow it. Uh, but for standard followers, I don't need this shit. 
If you like something not dumb like, from someone not else, the I don't ones like that. Where, not the ones where it's like a one like and two retweets. Like, get, get that out of here. At least give me one with like five retweets, ten likes. And, and it's like, You're okay, right. I see That's why. Right. I see why that made it in front of my face that clearly those 15 people, which generally they're the same person who retweets and likes. So those like five or six people. Yeah, I get that. I get why you wanted my attention there. I see you. Yep. There it is. Otherwise, we don't need it. We don't want it. We do not. But you you know what does help me get through this Philadelphia Philly season, though, in all honesty? What's that? Just food, two and five, seven nine four, food, two and five, seven nine four, three six six three. Treat yourself. Take it home. Just food is our sponsor, one of uh, many here at AMYP. We love them. And just food provides me with all of my favorite comfort food and comfort meals whilst watching at seven oh five every freaking night Philadelphia Phillies play baseball. Or attempt to. Just food and all of their brilliant wonderfulness in food form. It's just food two and five seven nine four. Food two and five seven nine four three six six three. Treat yourself. Take it home. Connor, you don't have the experience of just food since you're all the way up there in Canada. So why don't you tell us uh, your thoughts on Philadelphia Phillies and whether or not they make the postseason? I think that that man needs to franchise and <laughs> like franchise towards <laughs> Canada, not the U.S., but just saying. Um, so I got at Johnny Heller. Um, I love Johnny. That kid says, is so smart. And this this is a smart tweet. I did not bring, uh, you know, n- non-intelligent thoughts like you just spewed on our show. I bring only <laughs> the most of intelligent thoughts here. The Phillies haven't been within two games of a playoff spot this late in a season since 2011, which is dot, 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 sad. And then there's a response just underneath that I didn't even want to read, but I'm like, ah, that's funny. Almost as sad as a feeling I have for this team that is only two games out, but feels like 50. Is that not the truest statement? I've been like, like every time I look at the standings, I'm like, okay, they're two back. They're two back. They're two and a half. They're two, they're two, they're two and a half. And it's like, it feels like they've only been to like this far back. It oh, yeah. feels like it's been two for like literally ever. And it, they, so it does feel like it's they're 50 games back because we're making no progress. It's absurd. So like any time, like you could go on a run all you want, but if everyone else around you also goes on a run, it fucking means nothing. And then when you are collapsing and losing a ton of baseball games, when I don't know, everyone else that is in that chunk of, of what, six teams that are all vying for the second wild card right now, when they're all losing too. No one's gaining – like every one of these franchises and, and fan bases right now have to be so pissed off watching these teams. Like the Cubs, you got to be pissed off. If you're the Mets fan, a Mets fan, you got to be pissed off. Obviously, if you're a Philadelphia Phillies fan, you hate your life. Like this – any team uh, – the only team I can sit here and say like without a doubt I think is excited right now and like genuinely shocked and, and has reason to be like, oh, yeah, let's see what we can't make out of a potential postseason run. Has to be the Diamondbacks. They won like 14 or 15 games or something absurd after selling off pieces at the deadline. Like that was not supposed to happen. They weren't supposed to be here. They got hot when everyone else got cold. Now they're in the thick of things again. That's the only team in this chunk right now that deserves to not be pissed off. And we we can't string together any games whatsoever. So the fact that we're within two games is is really good. I, I'm going to say good. We're going to be end this on a positive note. That That's good. Good shit. <laughs> Good shit. (laughs) All right. So our final topic. So (laughs) the Sixers have been silent as all hell. It feels like like we can tackle one Sixers thought. It just came to my brain, by the way. So I am curious on your thoughts on it. So if if you don't mind, we'll we'll take like. Are we talking about Mike Scott dropping mitts with uh, Eagles fans? Was it not the most rewarding thing you've ever seen? I just can't. Why would you fight Mike Scott, man? You know he's a Redskins fan. And, like, you hear the video, the racial slur. It's like, man, oh, it, if I was ugly. the NBA, I'd say th- those guys deserved it. Like, legit, they deserved that. Oh, yeah. 100%. Because, like, why? Why are you picking up? Just when we were talking about. So this, this, this. Okay, you want to know my thoughts on this? Okay, here we go. So <laughs> last week on Crossing Borders, we talked about the Hive committing murder. <laughs> is this not the beginning of Did we speak this into term? existence? 
that like is this not the beginning like here you go someone just a bunch of completely ridiculous eagles fans just tried to fight mike scott out of complete disrespect for the hive is that not like is You're this right. not the beginning of that story that we we the hive committed murder who was at the philadelphia eagles game yesterday and saw someone wearing a mike scott jersey i need to know because that's the guy or girl that <laughs> that has committed the first one Wait, we have, has, it, has it come out yet though because like you you get philly news so is, has there been a murder committed and Nothing I yet. There's, there's no one. missing bodies the, the eagles okay. won yesterday so they i don't think they like went through the river to find bodies or anything yet so wait till the eagles lose tonight and they'll probably find a body in there and maybe that was the mike scott killer who knows <laughs> Yeah, well, okay, so beyond Mike Scott and uh, yeah. some completely ridiculous fans spewing racial slurs and creating a complete scene with one of the most appreciated athletes in Philly right now, there hasn't been much good news or news of any sort for the Sixers. So we're going to move to an all-around take, which I took to Twitter with a poll. What are your thoughts on holdouts in the NFL and how can the NFL fix this situation? So we got a 13% were for, 63% against, and the usual have to throw it in there, 25% don't give a fuck. <laughs> so, and then there was just a couple uh, couple comments. Our own at Radio Rob said, it's hard for me to go one way or the other. On one hand, contracts are supposed to be honored until the very end. So holding out compromises the integrity of the current contract that player is on. However, I can't blame the player for wanting the most dollars in a sport where their career could end instantly on any given play. I.e., we've seen it with, uh, we saw it with, well, Andrew Luck. And uh, linebacker from the Steelers last year, whose name slips my mind. Ryan Shazier. There you go. Ryan Shazier. And then one other tweet from Chris, Chris Schneider at Spots House. Per situations like Julio should not have did what he did for a new deal. He just inked a new deal and was mad and was mad people after him got more money. Disagree with that. If you're on a rookie deal making little and... You become a top player, you should push for a new deal for more money. I'm I'm a little confused. I didn't think Julio was much of an asshole about his situation, but maybe so. Um, I don't really think he was. Um, but I don't know. I will say this though, because Chris is out of Georgia. Um, at least last I I spoke with him, he's still. By the way, follow Spots House on YouTube. He's a he, he does like game videos and stuff. Uh, he used to do a sports show, though. I don't know if he's still doing it or not. Um, but when he did, they were, he did really, really nice NFL coverage. Um, so it was a show I thoroughly enjoyed. So give give Spots House a look. Um, but he is out of Georgia, so he may get some different local news that you know we, we don't get, that maybe he was making a little bit more of a fuss. Exactly. There's a potential there. But so so I guess I'll, I'll go first. Since go for it. Been getting uh, the first love. All right. Um, so this was uh, at, at Adam Schefter. Needs no Ooh, introduction. Blue Sheffy. check mark. Blue as they come. Text from an <laughs> NFL exec. This is the first legitimate step to be in NBA contracts. Julio might actually be the tipping point for the NFL to follow the NBA. Bad for clubs. Great for players. Um, so my my, I believe that the best. I'm completely against holdouts. That Z holdout completely ridiculous. I, like you have two years left on a contract. I get the final year, maybe, but then you have the situation like Melvin Gordon who says you can't win without me, and Eckler and Jackson have proved we don't fucking need you. And then you have the Zeke situation where they definitely needed him, and he started holding out way before necessary. Um, but we are okay with that contract. Um, and then there's just been so many other situations. It's just. It's childish. It's just a way to get what you want and to get a brand new contract and you don't have to worry about your career going right away. You get that more guaranteed dollars. You can say, oh, well, if I tear my both my ACLs and can't walk for the rest of my life, it's a very extreme. I know that's an extreme example, but um, I mean, then, you know, you have the guaranteed money and you can go and retire with their 40 million guaranteed dollars that they gave you but i think that the best the biggest thing to change is literally just to guarantee your contracts like the nhl and like the nba fully guaranteed you're gonna pay that guy 
this amount of money each year. This is how much you're going to get each year. And the only way out is to be bought out of it or to be traded. That seems the best way to do it, but I understand in the NFL because of the lifespans of of players and and stuff like that, it, it's a lot more difficult to just go like that because their careers aren't going to last as long. You could sign a guy to six years and he only makes it through two years. Then what do you do? Well, then you buy out his contract. Simple. Or you let him roll it out and see if he'll come back. But... I guess situations like the Andrew Luck situation then make that a bit more difficult. But the best way to do it is fully guaranteed contracts, just like the NBA and the NHL. I honestly think there's no other way about it. And I'm going to be the first to say to the end of that tweet, we don't give a fuck about clubs. We just give a fuck about sports and our athletes. I don't care if it costs a club more. I don't care if it costs the owner more. I was reading yesterday that Jeffrey Laurie and the Eagles are worth $3.05 billion. So so what if you have to fully guarantee all your contracts? This is not the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, I am 100% on the player's side here. Um, you know, to me, if uh, it's the wrong approach, I think because the arguments are, are, are apples and oranges at this point. But if I'm at work and, and I'm displeased with my salary, you know, I go to my supervisor and, or, you know, or our human resources department or however, whatever you have to go to. And you'd say, listen, I'm dramatically undervalued for the production that I bring to this company, you know, and I need to be paid as such. Like, And if I come with supporting numbers and trends that state, look, I am one of the best in my field, and Zeke Elliott is one of the top two running backs in football. He should be paid as such, and, and he should be able to go out there and represent himself in that capacity. What I think that the NFL should do, because and I understand the non-guarantees and contracts specifically because these injuries do happen, and the likelihood that your player is going to be the same physically as he is or as he was when he signed his contract if he signs a four or five year deal the likelihood that his physical nature is the exact same and the expectations for him physically are the exact same by year four or five it's it's unrealistic what should happen is there should be at least one depending on the length of contract negotiation period that is like you have to have this this is like this is some a part of the new cba however you want to make it where Agent, player, and organization all meet up into a room and say it's year you're entering year three of your five year deal, and you now have to renegotiate. You have to sit there, you have to take a look at your numbers. This can't be about what the rest of the team did. This has to be solely about your productivity because right now, so often these things are here, and organizations smartly use it to create cap room. You know, they so it's kind of like kind of like options, a player option, but have like a have a team yes, option at a but certain there's, point but it, there's at the end of the day they still need to remain on the contract that they are on with the team that they are they are so like baseball you know you have or basketball as well you have those player options and you have team options and shit like that where they sit there and they say listen we're going to choose to not exercise this or the player is going to say i'm going to choose to not exercise this and i'm going to enter free agency one year early and that's that's 100 percent their right. I, I don't mind that being on the final year of, a, of any contract in any sport. I, I think that that's fair, um, you know, playing out the duration of that contract to that point. It, it's but only, having one like halfway through is one right stupid. in the middle, like three, a player option at year three of a seven year contract is ridiculous. Why? Right. Like Manny Machado out there in San Diego. You know, he, he can he signed that massive deal if he wants to walk away. Well, he can. If he wants to, if he all of a sudden wants to live in a not so beautiful area and play winning baseball as opposed to losing baseball, well, maybe he leaves in three, year three. That's incorrect to me. What there should be is a year three of a contract. Option. Not, it's not even a mutual option. It's, a, it's a mutual like a, a renegotiation period. If I walk in to my offices and I say, listen, this is what I believe I am worth. Okay, you walk into that conversation. You have to find a common ground between player uh their representative and then representatives of the of the organization you have to find a new number if maybe they add more years but the aav goes down and it's more guaranteed because 
they're guaranteed through those added third or fourth years. So maybe it's more money in the long run, but it's a lesser AAV. That makes sense. Maybe the team chooses, look, there's some uncertainty with you. You're 33 years old. I'm not going to give you another contract after this yet. Why don't you, but you've outplayed a perfect example is Malcolm Jenkins. You've outplayed the contract number that you have, or at least we believe it as a fan base. And he believes it clearly. We should have the ability. He should have the ability to go into that conversation and just simply state, this is what I've brought to you. I have played 98% of these snaps. I am an integral part of, I am the leader and heart and soul of this defense. I am the pulse of this team or one of two of the pulses of this team. You have to pay me as such. And maybe he gets five more million dollars a year for the next two years or whatever it may be on top of the number that was there. That period of time should be there. There should be a mutual thing in there that states this is the time where you have to renegotiate based on the numbers there. That That's fair. I mean, I, I, um, option just sounds nice. Renegotiating, renegotiating period just sounds so unsexy and so unappealing. Like, oh, gross. Nope, I'm cool with it. <laughs> I'm cool with it because well, it's my idea. But <laughs> well, that's. I think there'd be some work that needed to be done because, like, at the end of the day, you might have a team saying this, a player saying this, and then it's like button heads, and like you need to have an arbitrator in the middle or something of like course. that. It could get it could get nasty, but I mean, or or the simplest of all things to solve this situation is give them fucking health care for life, them and their families. The one of the agree. biggest centerpieces. The one of the there. Is, is yeah, one of the biggest reasons that the guarantees are there and that the people want more money and more money and more money is because they have no health care. They're going to end up having to live the rest of their life with CTE, potentially Todd Gurley, who's probably going to need a wheelchair by 50 years old with his arthritic knees. Like th- these types of people have to pay for their health care. They have to pay for everything going forward. So, I mean, you could easily just continue with the way contracts are which will never make it through the nflpa and their next bargaining agreement or and just give them health care for life or go with the um renegotiating period thank you man the chain would like us to call it i think let's leave it to the fans renegotiating period what what would you call it what's a fun name to call that as we end the show let, let's just think i got it fun name i got it just put Cuba Gooding Jr., a picture of him or a gif of him that just says, show me the money. And it just plays over and over and over again at the year three mark. So the, the show me the money gif? That's it. Show me the money period? <laughs> that's it. We'll just we'll just call it a show me the money period. And it could be either way because if the player is getting more money, that's fantastic for the player. If the organization is saving some because they've underperformed and they can now give them a lower AAV and help out the cap situation or whatever they want to do but extended the years – Great fucking whatever. Now they get more money. So everyone's sitting in that room. Just show me the money. That's it. That's fair. All right. So so I think we're in agreement. Something needs to change. So what needs to, need change to change exactly? Well, that's what the NFL and the NFLPA get uh, the big bucks for uh, in a bargaining agreement. So we will see what happens. Hopefully without a lockout heading into the 2021-2022 season, I do believe. Um, so... With that in mind, I guess uh, now is a quick time to celebrate before we sign off. The Always Next Year podcast has officially hit 1,000 followers on Twitter. So let's just <laughs> quick round of applause there. That sounds we got funky, a, we got a, just so we, you know. What? That sounds weird, just so you know. Oh, that I that I clapped or that I have we have a thousand followers. A uh, so thousand followers no one really gives a shit about, but no, the awkward clapping in the microphone sounds like fap 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 fap, which is <laughs> honestly a little weird. Just saying. Okay, well, but, I, uh, whatever, whatever. I'm excited for a thousand followers. All right. Well, good okay. man. Hey, let's, we got a guarantee take of the pride week. in our work. To talk about my friend. Oh, and a guarantee of the week. Okay, so we celebrate a thousand followers too soon. What we'll, is we'll your guarantee? Back up again in just a moment. We, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. I'll do that again. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Quick so, back right up there in Canada. So what is your guarantee? Man, we just had a hurricane. Okay, man, I, I'm just, I'm still getting over that. <laughs> All right, that's fair. I'll give you that. So you. guarantee of the week. So mine didn't go through. Yours didn't go through. We lost to the Mets that day, but uh, Vargas didn't get rocked and it didn't end in extra innings, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. So and of Vargas course, Vargas did get rocked, by the way. Not a, not as bad as I, I felt. Your guarantee insinuated, but 
Whatever. You know what? You know what? At the end of the day, we well, I was wrong regardless. We but. were both were, we were both <laughs> wrong. Travis Konechny remains unsigned, and Jason Vargas got hit pretty good, but there was no big comeback and extra innings gate loss. So, um, what's your guarantee for this week? All right. So I alluded to one earlier, uh, and you know I basically stated. But it's like a season long thing, so I can't really use it. But it was basically the, the whole coaching thing is going to be the difference between make, making a deep playoff run for the Eagles and not. I think it's not a lack of question of talent, but it's Doug Peterson, you know, calling correct plays and Jim Schwartz not being as stubborn ass as he always is. Uh, but that one can't come true just this week alone. So I do have another one. My other one is, and it, for me to bring this up, you must have known that I was bored and incredibly pissed off today because I genuinely I am not offended by a fucking thing on this planet. You can say whatever you want to me or about me. I do not give a damn. Down the alarm. The, Shane got offended. Oh, no, 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 no. I misrepresented the way that I was stating this. I'm not offended at all, but I understand that all of Twitter is. So here is the, the guarantee. If you do not know, uh, Angelo Cataldi this morning had offended the incorrect Philadelphia Philly. I can't, I'm not going to give a name, but I'm sure people will understand and know who I'm talking about. By the way, she does fantastic work and she should 100% be known for her work and nothing else. Um, but he attacked kind of this girl on the morning show this morning and Twitter is in an uproar because this girl has oh, essentially a cult boy, following. It. Yes. Is this a photographer? Yes. Um, I saw on Twitter, I don't even listen to Philly radio because, well, I live in Canada, so why the fuck would I? Exactly. But yes, continue. Um, but again, there is, and I look, they're, they're all brilliant in what they do. There are a ton of women uh, in Philadelphia sports who are looking to make it, and this young photographer is certainly one of them, and she's very, very good at what she does. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think I think this may finally be it. I think that An Angelo Cataldi may have picked the wrong person in the year 2019 to offend and to piss off their following because I, I don't think that WIP is going to hear the end of it until Cataldi is at a minimum suspended. So I'm going to say my guarantee of the week is that by the end of this week, Angelo Cataldi will be on a mysterious leave that will not be called a suspension, but it will essentially be one at a minimum over there at WIP uh, for overly sexualizing young women. Yeah, it's, gonna, just, it's finally going to happen. Just the disrespect. I mean, I, I've seen I saw a lot of this stuff on Twitter. I don't know what he said, but I mean, I don't care what I he can, said. I can only imagine. It doesn't, to, for Twitter to blow up like this and for, for that to be the, like the comments being said, it definitely isn't something worth listening to or giving him the time of day. Yeah, like at I said, all. if I was, and I will never know what this is like, but if I were a young female and some of the things that he said were being said about me instead, I'll be honest, I wouldn't give two shits. Nothing offends me, but I've never had to experience what women in the industry or women in any industry for that matter do have to experience. So I understand that I have no credibility to speak on that. So all I'm going to say on this matter is in the year of 2019, if you piss off someone who has a, a significant enough and dedicated enough following base as this particular individual has, you made a really, really poor career decision. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this this may be the beginning of the end for for AC over there and WIP's morning show. Um, and pissed there's off the few wrong human. people who would be very saddened by it. So uh, that there is will not okay. be very many saddened. Um, um, so I, I, I guess I'll I'll lighten up the mood for the uh, the guarantee of the week here so for those of you who may not have noticed kevin weeks reported that zach were zach Wierenski signed a three-year 15 million dollar deal that is a five million dollar are you re-upping on the tk pre per year i am not re-upping on the tk i am taking ivan provarov ivan provarov wanted what some nine million dollars and Wierenski is the first domino to fall of those three rfa uh, defenseman, and it could not have fallen more in the team's favor. I think that he will. 
I'm going to say Provorov takes a bridge deal because we will give him more money on the bridge deal than the long-term deal. So I think he goes and he will sign a two-year, let's call it uh, average $7.5 million a year deal. So two years, $15 million, similar to Borensky, but minus a year, prove it deal, $7.5 million. So I will million and a half less than what he wants, but he does well, a I bridge hate deal. deal. But... <laughs> I, I, I hate it. A... I hate it too. But I mean, at the end of the day, I think he's going to want more money. So he's going to take whichever side of the bridge has more money. So if the bridge contract has the more money, he's going to take it. If the long term has the more money, he's going to take the long term. I think he's going to go with a short term bridge contract. But Ivan Provorov, who cares about the dollar figure? I don't get paid to worry about that. Ivan Provorov is signing this week. I hope to God, man. I truly do. Yeah, I got you hyped up about Konechny, so let's just uh, – that's my guarantee of the week, but let's just kind of like like a lighter guarantee of the week so we don't get too hyped up. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, anyways, thank you to our 1,000 followers and to those who are just joining us. Go out there and spread the good word of the Always Next Year Podcast Network and help us continue to grow our following because we give you the best of Philly sports, all Philly sports, and the Chiefs. And the Chiefs, one, and one wrestling, Chiefs show. And, and whiskey and rambling. Show. And yep, yeah, We just get of, drunk and talk about things. Lots of drunken rambles, the Chiefs, wrestling, and literally every sport in philadelphia except the philadelphia union because well we don't watch soccer so um but that is it for this episode of crossing borders uh you can follow us on twitter at the uh, a n y podcast or shane at what is your handle again <laughs> My bad. Uh, so you can get me. Uh, it's at Shane underscore Mead. You can also follow us on the website. It's www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. And there is a link on the contact page of that website to which you guys can then reach out and get us on the WhatsApp. That's right. It's called WhatsApp. Didn't realize that's what Getting it was called. Getting with the times. Getting with the times. But, yes, yeah, so you guys can text us live during games and we will respond if – if one of the members is uh, is able to, we will certainly respond to your rents, rants and vents. Yeah, putting words if together. You wanna, if you want to pay us rent, we will take that as well. That's correct. Uh, I will, especially given my current and, sitch. And you can also follow me at Connor10, T-E-N, and uh, keep your eyes and ears out for Backyard Beers and Football and Kelly Green Hour. we got lots of great Eagles content coming up for the rest Hell of yes. the week previewing and reviewing previewing for a massive falcons game next sunday and reviewing the does it scare team. you by the way real real quick thought does it scare you that the falcons did not look good this week no it makes me feel great oh, but man, I, feel I feel like, like they're gonna I come feel in like just, they're gonna yeah oh. they're gonna it's gonna be a shootout i think yeah, we're gonna, gonna be looking nuts. at a nice sunday night game much just, better than this past week's yeah genuinely hope that the secondary comes to play uh, a little little better a little more consistent next week but anyway Fine, that was my final thought. <laughs> but for the Always Next Year podcast, I'm Connor. He's Shane. Thank you so much for listening. Send us over to the Jack Dolls. A plain man I used to be, revered and feared through Killarney. Now I'm back, pitching with the wind. But if Mickey Flynn should ever fight me, I'll throw me call shit all behind me and square off on that son of a bitch again. He cracked up in a river too. He beat me Sunday through and through. And so she go to my uncle. Is I won me healthy sheriff fights, well lucky son still happy life since Mickey Flynn beat me dumb and lame. <laughs>